The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. So, Brian Baptist Church, this is our preaching service for July 19th. Uh, we are disappointed that we can't worship together in person today. But still, we can enjoy the reading and preaching of God's Word. The past few weeks have been unusual with the restrictions placed on us, but we were content to endure those so we could be together and fellowship in the church. But we are sad and it is necessary that we return to this format. For church members and friends who have attended church these past few Sundays, we will keep you updated about changes to our in-person services. Just pray that it won't be too long before we see each other again. We begin our worship time together this morning in the book of Colossians. If you take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 1, I'll read verses 21 through 27. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now we'd like for you to sing with us, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Wrapped in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners Hangs the Lamb in victory See the price of our redemption See the Father's plan unfold Bringing many sons to glory Grace unmeasured, love untold Come behold the wondrous mystery Slain by death the God of life But no grave could e'er restrain him Praise the Lord, he is alive 
What a foretest of deliverance, how unwavering our hope, Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when he comes. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my light be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor men's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. My King of Heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach Heaven's joys, O bright Heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of Now, if you would open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read some scripture. We'll look at the first 10 verses of this chapter, and I want you to hold on to these. Uh, they are important as we uh, prepare for the message today, and we'll refer back somewhat to these verses. So if you'll look then at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're going to sing together now, His Robes for Mine. His 
his robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ masters in my stead. Faultless I stand, with righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord, vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost, Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God, bought by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath, on sin then Christ is done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as though I, the curse and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. Before these past few weeks, we were having these types of services that is a recording that you would watch from your home. And after many weeks of doing that, it would seem that we're old hands at it, we're pros at it, but I have to admit to you that coming back to it today is unsettling. I still don't like preaching to an empty church, but we are happy again that we can look into the Word of God and we can use this venue in order to preach the Word of God to you. Now, I'd like you to open your Bibles once again to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians chapter 2. I, I want to read this passage before I begin comments on the text. We read the first part of the chapter in the scripture reading just a few minutes ago, and now I'd like for us to look at the rest of this chapter, beginning in verse 11, and this will help us to see the context of my opening remarks. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 11. 
Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now today I'd like for us to look at this important passage in the New Testament. Uh, this text is relevant to every Christian who hears the message today. In the past few weeks, racial strife in our country has risen to the boiling point and is spilling over into the streets in a wave of violence. And I would say that we haven't seen this kind of division since I was a child. Uh, back in the 1960s, civil unrest culminated in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Racial division has always been a part of human experience, and you can go all the way back to the separation of people in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, and there you find division. Now, my purpose today is not to preach on racial division, but I mention it only because it is at the heart of this text in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, in the Bible, the major division of people is not because of skin color. I mean, the Bible has very little to say about the color of our skin. But instead, the physical division is between two types of people. It is between those who are descended from Jacob and those who are descended from Esau. Those descended from Jacob are the Jews. They are Israel while those that are descended from Esau are the Gentiles. And we could go back even further. We can go back to Isaac and Ishmael because the descendants of Ishmael were also Gentiles. Now maybe you don't understand the word Gentiles, but that word simply means nations. And any other nation that doesn't come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are Gentiles. Now in the Old Testament, this division between those who were of God's chosen nation and those who had no party to the covenants that God made with Israel, his chosen people, that, that division looms throughout the Old Testament and God intended for it to be that way, to keep his people distinct and separate until the time that he would send his own son as a descendant of Israel into the world. Well, by the time that we come to the New Testament, this division was transformed into hatred and extreme prejudice on both sides. The Bible is the story of redemption, and that redemption comes through Jesus Christ, who was a Jew, whose human ancestry came through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, the hatred of Jews against Gentiles was so advanced when Jesus came that the Jews didn't believe that Gentiles could be saved. The Gentiles were referred to as dogs. They were outcast, and the Jews didn't want anything to do with them. Well, in this text, Paul acknowledged that separation. 
And in verses 11 and 12, he referred to the Gentiles as the uncircumcised. That is, they are people that had no part in the covenants that God made with his people. Paul, of course, here is writing to a Gentile church. He founded this church on his second missionary journey. And so these are people that received the gospel, they were saved by the gospel, and they had entered into a new covenant that was established by the death of Christ on the cross. And in this new covenant, there is no division between Jews and Gentiles. The new covenant is not with the Jews only, but is a covenant that includes all believers, and through this covenant, all believers, Jews and Gentiles, become unified, a people unified in Christ. Now, I say that this text is relevant to Christians today because most that would be listening to the message are Gentiles, and if there are any listening of Jewish descent, your ancestry is now yoked to your Gentile brothers in Christ, so there is no division between you and them. In this new covenant, we are Christians. We are just simply Christians. There are no racial divisions. There are no ethnic divisions. There are no covenant divisions. We are all one in Christ. And according to verse number 16, the cross of Christ is what reconciles us to God. And in verse number 18, we have the same access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. Now today I'd like to talk to you about three areas Three areas of unity that belong to Christians. We share commonality that should end our divisions. It should heal our divisions, any that previously existed between us. Now, two of these areas come automatically by trusting Christ as Savior. But the third is a special act of obedience. And the third is the highest expression of unity that we experience. Well, what then is the, is the basis of our unity? Well, we start at the very basic level. We start at the lowest common denominator of unity, and this is the kingdom of God. We are all in God's kingdom. Now, when you become a child of God, you automatically become a citizen of God's kingdom. Now, verse number 19 refers to this kingdom when the apostle says that Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. You are citizens. There's an error that's common in Christianity, and that is to confuse the kingdom with the church and make these two synonymous. But the kingdom and the church are not the same thing. In fact, kingdom and church are translated from two entirely different Greek words that are not interchangeable. The church is an assembly, it's a gathering of people into one place that's in a certain location. A kingdom doesn't refer to an assembly, a kingdom is the domain of a king. A church assembly is necessarily local, that is a group of people that are in one place, but a kingdom is not local, it's universal. And this kingdom that we uh, r talk about in the Bible goes across the entire world. The domain of the king is all people who believe in Jesus Christ. The confusion of these two terms has led to the idea of a universal church. The kingdom is universal, but not the church. When you get saved, there's nothing that you need to do to enter the kingdom. God's kingdom is universal, and you enter the universal domain of the king as you are placed there automatically by your citizenship granted by the king. Now, as Paul wrote to wrote this text, Jews and Gentiles, he says, are fellow citizens in this kingdom. We are all equal in the kingdom. When you enter the kingdom, you receive the great advantages of kingdom citizens that are only, only the king's subjects can enjoy. Well, what are these advantages? Well, let me list four of you that you receive when you trust Christ and you enter his kingdom. The first is that we share a common relationship. In verse 19, Paul says that we, we are no more strangers and foreigners. Now, what is a stranger? Well, a stranger is a person who goes to an area where the people are not his. 
you visit another country, the people are not your people. The habits and the customs are different. The language is different. Sometimes the language isn't different, but the pronunciation of words and expressions are different. As General Patton said, the British and Americans are two great people that are separated by a common language. And I know what he means by that. Sometimes my wife and I will watch a, a television show that's produced by the BBC, and often I need to turn on the subtitles because I can't understand the English. Pastor Moongo, when he comes to visit us, I think I need subtitles for his messages because I don't understand much of his colonial English. In other countries, food may be different. Much of the time, dress is different. And sometimes just the common everyday activities of life can be different. And so because of this, there is an easiness, there is an unsettled feeling when you're in a foreign country. Usually you don't get very comfortable. And I think the best way that I could describe it is simply this. It just isn't home. But when you're in your country, you share a common relationship with the people so that just about everybody, we follow the same customs, we dress the same, we talk the same, except maybe for regional difference. We share many common goals and opinions. And, and this is the picture that Paul paints of the Christian relationship in the kingdom. Christians are fellow citizens of the same country. And that country is heaven, as he explains in Philippians 3, verse 20. Our citizenship, he says, is in heaven. And as believers, we together look for Christ to come. The people that are in God's kingdom are uniform because we've all been transformed into one image that is the image of Christ. All of us have a relationship with Christ and because of that relationship we all have a relationship with each other. Now the second advantage that we note is that we share common laws. In, in a foreign country they have different laws. Some of them are different. For instance, I, I don't have any trouble getting in my car and traveling our highways because I'm used to our ways, I'm used to our customs and the way that we drive. A few years ago, I was driving in England and I couldn't get used to it. I mean, it just doesn't seem right to drive on the left-hand side of the road. That was just seriously messed up. And I remember as I was driving, I came to a roundabout and I hate those. I, I have trouble with those here in our country when I'm driving on the right-hand side of the road. So now, here I am in England. I'm driving on the left-hand side of the road. And to add to the problem, I had rented a car in Germany that had a steering wheel on the left, just like our cars. So I'm driving, and I'm trying to get into the flow of these roundabouts. I'm driving on the left-hand side of the road with the steering wheel also on the left. And I was thoroughly confused about what to do. I could tell I was in a foreign country because I saw lots of international hand signals that I've seen before. I understand the laws of our country and so I can drive without problems according to our laws. And when you become a Christian, you live by a different law. You live under the laws of God's kingdom. You understand those laws. Unsaved people are not in our kingdom and they don't understand. Why do they need to obey God's laws? And they don't care to follow God's laws. But as a believer, you, you can come to church or you can sit and listen to me preach a sermon and I talk about sin and I speak about obeying God's commandments and the sermon resonates. You understand, you know why you need to take that sermon and apply it to your life. How do you tell when someone is a foreigner? Well, if you get on a two-lane highway and someone's coming at you in your lane, then you know something is wrong. They must not be from around here. And when a person is not a child of God, their lifestyle, their habits, the code that they live by, identifies them as citizens of the devil's kingdom, not God's kingdom. And so we need to be sure, as God's people, that we don't send mixed signals about our citizenship. Don't follow the laws and the customs of the devil's kingdom. This world is the devil's domain. And when we act like the world, we don't look like strangers to this world. We look like we belong in the devil's company. Citizens of God's kingdom should look like strangers in Satan's domain. We're not of this world and we shouldn't look like we are. And what does 
Paul say here? He says, as believers, you're not strangers in God's kingdom. You live under His laws, and obeying them is characteristic of His citizens. Now, the third thing that we would notice about being in the kingdom is that we share common privileges. We share a common relationship and common laws, and we also have common privileges. Now, I don't want to be known as a foreigner because I like my privileges. As an American citizen, I have the right to vote. I don't have anybody worth voting for, but I have the right to vote. And even though I don't use them, I have access to certain government programs because I am a citizen. Now, of course, that might not be the best analogy that I could use because nowadays it really doesn't matter if you're a citizen or an illegal alien. You can still access government programs as if you belong here. And I don't understand that because you can break the laws of this country, you can enter illegally, and you can still get access to the benefits of law-abiding citizens. Well, that doesn't seem quite right to me, especially when there isn't any money to fix roads, the uh, health care costs are astronomical, taxes are just plain scary, and yet we give out money to people that break the law. But such is the contradiction of living in the devil's domain. Now, I can assure you that God's kingdom is different. You don't get the privileges of God's people without being in his kingdom. You don't get the resources of his kingdom without being a citizen. Now, according to these verses, there is nobody but citizens of God's kingdom that have access to the Father. If they did, then Paul's point about what these people were before they became believers is a moot point. We have personal access to the Father who is the King of the Kingdom. We, we, we can speak to Him. We can ask of Him because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Now, no one who doesn't believe in Christ has this access. Being able to pray, being able to talk to the King, that is a great privilege. And resources, we think of resources that are part of the privileges. You have the power and the weight of the Kingdom behind you. Now, it used to be when an American was overseas and was treated wrongly that this nation would come to the aid of that one individual. I mean, especially if you were in the military, you could expect that the whole weight of the U.S. government would come to your aid. And it's still that way with God. You may be just one individual, but you have unlimited resources at your disposal. God will dispatch angels if you need it. You have the power and the weight of heaven and angelic armies stand behind you and go before you. You are surrounded by heaven's guardians. You have access to all the treasures of the kingdom. The Bible says that you are an heir of all the riches of Christ. And so the privileges are astounding. But then there is a fourth characteristic of being in the kingdom... We share common responsibilities. Now, we ought not to look at privileges without thinking of responsibilities. In America, you may have the rights of American citizens, but those rights come with a price. To live here, the government says, you must pay taxes. And if you don't pay taxes, well, you don't stop being a citizen, but you can sure be sorry if you don't pay up. We have responsibilities as citizens. One thing that we need to remember is that there are people that served this country, that gave their lives so that we could enjoy our privileges. In the Revolutionary War, it was Nathan Hale who said, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. And that's an example of how self-sacrifice preserved the freedoms of this nation. And self-sacrifice is what Jesus taught about his kingdom. Our responsibility is to advance God's kingdom, and that comes at the expense of our lives sometimes. If it's necessary, we must do it. The king of the kingdom sacrificed his life. He gave up self to win the freedoms that we have in him. We also, in this country, have a responsibility to defend our country. We defend and honor our flag. I will still stand up when I hear the national anthem. I won't kneel as if my cause is greater than our cause. I won't burn the flag of our country and spit on the graves of those who died for it. And as Christians, we are also called upon 
to defend God's kingdom against the attacks of modernism, against the attacks of the teachings of false prophets. Today we battle over the veracity and the infallibility of God's word. Churches and ministers have abandoned infallibility and inspiration of scripture, but it's our responsibility to defend it and to keep our doctrinal standards. As pastor, one of my jobs is to secure our border. That is the border of doctrine and not let heresies cross our border. Now today there is a battle that we fight against generic Christianity that says doctrine doesn't matter. We should exclude doctrine, they say, as a basis of unity. Doctrine separates, they say, and yet God's word says that our unity is dependent upon the doctrines of Jesus and the apostles. Now if you look for a moment in chapter 4, in the third verse, going down to the sixth verse, here the apostle says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then going further down in the chapter to verses 11 through 13, it says that apostles and pastors and teachers were given to the church to perfect the church. And we may ask the question, well, how do they perfect the church? Well, it's according to our doctrines, our teachings that bring us unity in the faith. And so the enemy are those who want to tear down denominational walls. They're ones who want to abandon our beliefs in the doctrines of grace and baptism in the local church. They are the enemy, and it's our responsibility to preach the truth and do it week after week, no matter how many churches in Roner Park or in this county think otherwise. Believers have responsibilities in the kingdom. Now, secondly, believers are unified because we are all in God's family. Here's another unifying factor that comes automatically when you receive Christ as Savior. You become a part of God's family. Everyone that is saved is a part of God's family. Now, you see, being part of a family is different from being part of a kingdom. In a kingdom, there is a relationship, and we've just spoken of it. But being from the same country doesn't necessarily mean that there is a close relationship. For example, we're proud of our heritage as Americans. But although we're bound in some form of relationship by virtue of our citizenship, that is not really necessarily an intimate relationship. There are people in New York. They are American citizens, and, and I sympathize with them over the tragedy of so many lives that were lost due to COVID-19. There are people in New Orleans and on the Gulf Coast, and they are Americans, and I sympathize with them over devastating natural disasters like hurricanes, but my relationship with those people is not intimate. Well, now Paul goes on in this 19th verse and he progresses further into the idea of oneness and unity in Christ. He says that we are fellow citizens. That identifies the kingdom. That is our country. And then he goes on to say, and of the household of God. What is a household? Well, he means a family. What's different about being in a family? Why is a family closer than just being citizens of the same country? Why? Well, first, in a family, there is a blood relationship. We're not merely acquaintances. We're related by blood. I have some nice neighbors that I speak to, and they are acquaintances. There's a checker at the grocery store who recognizes me each time that I go in. There's a guy that I regularly meet on the trail where I walk, and we exchange greetings as we go by. We are acquaintances. My wife and I have many acquaintances at the Kaiser Hospital emergency room. Now, you may be friends with someone in your office, but they don't have a blood relationship with you. We feel closer to family because of blood. In the United States, we're bound to each other by the law, but in a family, we're bound to each other by blood. And the easiest way to tell the difference between blood and acquaintance is when you cross a member of a person's family. Now, as pastor 
And having been in church all of my life, I know how people act when it comes to family. I've seen people that love the pastor. They are best friends with the pastor. They say, Pastor, we will do anything for you. But the moment that he must discipline, or the church disciplines a family member, then the relationship changes. Blood is thicker than water, people say. And that means that our family relationships are closer than any other relationships. And so therefore, Paul moves upward in explaining what we are as Christians. We are citizens of a heavenly country. That's basic. But our relationship is closer than just citizens. We are also related by blood. We're members of the same family through the blood of Christ. Now, if you have your Bibles there, if you'll look in John 6, this is what Jesus said about the relationship of his blood and his family. In John chapter 6 and verse number 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now what Jesus says in these verses is that you must ingest him. He must become a part of you. His life-giving blood must flow through your veins. And when you have the blood of Christ applied to you, you become his blood brother. You, you are a part of his family, and his father is your father. And so it's better than being just the citizen of a country. It's being blood related to a family. There's a blood relationship. And what does that blood relationship do? Well, it genders intimacy. And that's the next point. There is an intimate relationship. You, you, you are part of something that's more intimate than being an acquaintance. Has this ever happened to you? You go into someone's house and you're there with, their, with the family members and some family member comes in with a problem. The family wants to discuss the problem, but you're sitting there and they feel uncomfortable about discussing it in front of you. Now, they may do one of two things. They might wait to discuss it until after you're gone. Or if it's a pressing problem, they may ask you to leave so they can deal with the problem right then. Now, do you see? You may be a friend, but you don't have the intimacy of family. And therefore, people have their family secrets. The family is close-knit. It is intimate. And many people don't want to divulge information to those that are outside of the family. Well, being in the family, that is a step up from being only in the kingdom because of intimacy. There is more care and concern because families always care about their own more than they do others. So Paul says here, you are of the household of God. That means we are in God's family and we have this intimate blood relationship with him. Well, now we come to the third statement of unity. We are in God's church. Now, you'll notice this time I dropped the all. I do not say that we are all in God's church. In the beginning, I said there are two areas of unity that come automatically. When you are saved, you are automatically in God's kingdom. You are automatically in God's family. But this third area is not automatic. And this is where we differ from many others because we don't believe that when a person is saved, he is automatically in the church. Now, those that confuse church and kingdom will say that everybody that's saved is a part of the church. But the Bible never says that. In fact, of the 118 times that the word church is translated from the Greek New Testament, uh, 115 references are to the local church, churches like Ephesus and Corinth, Antioch, the church in Jerusalem. There are only three references that are not to the local church. One has nothing to do with the church. One is to the institution of the church. And the last is a reference to the church in prospect. Never does the Bible say that anyone who is saved is automatically in the church. Now we notice this is the case as we look in Acts in the second chapter, Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. 
there were 3,000 people that were saved. And if you check that out, you'll notice in verse 41, it says, those that received the word were baptized and were added to them. And the question is, well, what then were they added to? Well, they were added to the assembly, to the local church that met in Jerusalem. So you don't automatically become a member of the church when you're saved. The only way to get into the church is to be baptized under church authority. You are automatically in the kingdom, automatically in the family. But to be in the church, you must take the next step of baptism, which is the door into the church. So from the kingdom to the family, that is a step up. From the family into the church, that is another step up. And this is because there is an increasingly special relationship with Christ. This is the highest relationship to be had with Christ. Now let me finish by showing you three important biblical metaphors that are used for the church. The first is that we are Christ building. In our text verses, in verses 20 and 21, the scripture says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. The first metaphor is that of a building. Oh, now the relationship is getting closer. Being a citizen, that's great. Being part of a family, that's great. But you can have family members that live far away. We have 127 grandchildren in Kentucky. We love them. We love each other, but we're not together. We're 2,500 miles apart. You ever seen a building that's not together? Can you have a building with a foundation that's in one place and walls that are in another place and roof in still another place? No, if you separate the parts of a building, you no longer have a building. You have a lumber yard. A building is a cohesive unit and the parts are connected to one another so that the building is not complete unless all the parts are assembled. Now, those of you that are familiar with our building here in Rohnert Park, uh, there's the, the superstructure with, with walls, of course, that are about 16, 18 feet tall, maybe 20 feet, I don't know exactly. Huge beams that go across the ceiling. And if you take half the studs out of one of the outer walls, I promise you this building will collapse. And as a church, we are God's building, and we must be fitted together into a framework that works together. We can't be independent of each other. Our families, we may exist apart from one another. I can have my family members in Kentucky and still have a family, but we can't have a church that is properly constituted unless we're all together. And when too many of the church are not together, the building falls. Now the second metaphor for the church is a body. We are Christ's body. In the fifth chapter, verse 30 of Ephesians, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now I think you understand that a body is still yet closer than the relationship in a relationship in a building. A body is organic. Life flows through a body. A body is moving, it's living, it's breathing. And every part of that body is important. A body doesn't function well without all of its parts. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul wrote an extended passage comparing the church to the human body. He compared believers to body parts, and he spoke of the importance of every member. He spoke of church members as hands and eyes and ears and noses. And he said all of these parts are intricately connected. The body needs them all. And without these body parts, you can't hear, can't smell, and can't see. In the 25th verse, he said there should be no schisms in the body. That is... There are to be no divisions among the members of the church because the body can't be intimate and can't care for other parts of the body if the body is divided. You know, I once saw a television program. There was a young man that was born without, without arms, and yet he learned to play the piano with his feet and his toes. Now, you can do that because he did, but it'll never work as well as using your hands and your fingers. The metaphor of the body is used to show how precisely connected we must be. And the human body is amazing. The church is compared to the unfathomable, intelligent design of the human body. 
And I would tell anybody that the church body is a fabulous design and God does amazing things in this world through his church. It is imperative that Christians become a part of the church. Well, there is one last metaphor for the unity of the church. We are Christ's building and we are Christ's body. Then thirdly, we are Christ's bride. The bride of Christ, that is a big subject. I can't do it justice in the time left, but I do want to say that it is beyond our capacity to understand it fully. What does it mean for Christ to be married to the church? Well, the bride of Christ is the church, and the scriptures say that we are betrothed to Christ, and God is preparing us for a wedding to his son. Now, there isn't a closer relationship than that of husband and wife. Jesus said that a man leaves his father and his mother, and he cleaves to his wife. The relationship of husband and wife is closer than that of blood relatives, closer than that of father and mother. He said they cleave together and they become one flesh. So a man takes his wife, she becomes bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And how is it possible to be closer than being grafted into another person's body? In Ephesians 5, if you care to look at it, Paul uses marriage as, as emblematic of the Lord's church. And the comparison is that the Lord nourishes his church and he cares for it as a man does his wife because his wife is a part of his body. In the 31st verse of chapter 5, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. And I would say, yes, it absolutely is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. There isn't a closer relationship than this. There can't be unity expressed in a more graphic way than the union between husband and wife, which is emblematic of the unity between Christ and his church. And so a believer who becomes a part of the Lord's church, you have the privilege of this incredible unity. Now let me close by reading from the back of the book. This scripture takes place when this world draws to its close. To its close, what happens to the church at the end? Well, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, this is explained. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So what happens to the church? The bride becomes the wife. She's no longer betrothed with the promise of marriage. She now realizes this centuries-old promise that she will be made the wife. And that is as close as we can get to God. And then in another metaphor, this one is added to the list. It's another way that God speaks of his people. The bride is also spoken of as a city. In Revelation 21 verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so after this world is destroyed and then recreated, there will be a great marriage feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb, and the faithful of the church will be united to him in the holiest of matrimony, and we will live and love and worship him forever. Well, I said that a family is closer than citizens of the same country. A church is closer than a family. A body is closer than a building, but the closest of all is the bride. In a marriage, the bride forsakes all others, even her father and her mother, to be united to her husband. So marriage is the most intimate of all relationships, and the relationship between Jesus and his bride is the closest that's been created. It's right next to, and I say this reverently, just one step below the Trinity of God. 
Don't take membership in the church lightly. And so do you see how Paul incredibly builds to a climax in this chapter? He started with the depths of our depravity. We read that earlier, verses 1 and 2 in chapter 2. We had no hope. He goes on to say, we have no hope. We were without God. We were strangers to the covenant. And then he brings us to the grace of God. And then he tells us we can be a part of the covenant of God. And then he says that we're in God's kingdom. But it's better. We are in God's family. And still better, we can be in God's church. And still better yet, we can be a part of his bride. This is the unity of believers. It's the special eternal privileges of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. I encourage you to make sure that those privileges are yours. And consider... Uh, consider especially this last one. Are you in the church of Jesus Christ? And that is the way to have the most intimate relationship with the eternal God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises that are made in your word. What wonderful privileges become ours when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. You bring us into your kingdom where you are the king of the kingdom and the laws of the kingdom are good laws that are for our best benefit. The privileges that are granted to us are beyond our imagination. The riches of the kingdom we can't explain. But better than that, you brought us into your family. You have an intimate relationship with us bought by the blood of Jesus Christ so that as we say, his royal blood flows through our veins. But then it gets even better, according to the apostle. We are brought into the Lord's church, into your church that you gave your life for, that you loved above all others. We can be a part of that church as we put our faith in Jesus Christ and then are baptized and enter that door of the church where we can serve you together as the people of God. What a wonderful expression that you've given us of being in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and being the bride of Christ, the most intimate relationship possible. Lord, we pray for those who hear the message today. We pray that they would seriously consider the importance of being in the church. First, the importance of salvation. But we want to move higher in our salvation, not just part of the kingdom, not just part of a family, but to be in the church where Jesus Christ receives his greatest glory. Thank you, Father, for this message today. We also pray, Lord, that we'll soon end this type of meeting together, not in our homes, but we'll be able to be in our church. We look forward to that again. We give you the praise for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to leave you today with a benediction from God's Word. This is in Revelation chapter 22. It's been good to speak to you, the Word of God today. And I want to read from Revelation 22 as we part from each other in this video. Hopefully, I surely do wish that the next time that we would be able to be together again in, in our church building. But here, Jesus speaks, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Take that scripture, think about it this week. Be safe and go with God. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707 584-7275 or write to us at Berean Baptist Church 6298 Country Club Drive Rohnert Park, California 94928 Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org